another edition of Battle Bits. Today, we are going to be reading the first chapter of The Mysterious Benedict Society by Trenton Lee Stewart. And we're actually not going to read the whole first chapter because it's very long. So I'll read a portion of it up to a good stopping point, which is still rather long. So sit back, relax, and enjoy The Mysterious Benedict Society. And the first chapter is called Pencils, Erasers, and Disqualification. In a city called Stonetown, near a port called Stonetown Harbor, a boy named Rainy Muldoon was preparing to take an important test. It was the second test of the day. The first had been in an office across town. After that one, he was told to come here, to the Monk Building on 3rd Street, and to bring nothing but a single pencil and a single rubber eraser, and to arrive no later than 1 o'clock. If he happened to be late, or bring two pencils, or forget his eraser, or in any other way deviate from the instructions, he would not be allowed to take the test, and that would be that. Rainy, who very much wanted to take it, was careful to follow the instructions. Curiously enough, these were the only ones given. He was not told how to get to the Monk Building, for example, and had found it necessary to ask directions to the nearest bus stop, acquire a schedule from a dishonest bus driver who tried to trick him into paying for it, and walk several blocks to catch the Third Street bus. Not that any of this was difficult for Rainy Muldoon. Although he was only 11 years old, he was quite used to figuring things out for himself. From somewhere across the city, a church bell struck the half hour. 12.30, he still had a while to wait. When he checked the doors of the Monk Building at noon, they were locked. So Rainy had bought a sandwich at a deli stand and sat down on this park bench to eat. A tall building in Stonetown's business district must surely have many offices inside, he thought. Locked doors at noon seemed a little peculiar, but then what hadn't been peculiar about this whole affair? To begin with, there was the advertisement. A few days before, Rainey had been reading the newspaper over breakfast at the Stonetown Orphanage, sharing sections with his tutor, Miss Paramal. As Rainey had already completed all the textbooks on his own, even those for high school students, the orphanage director had assigned him a special tutor while the other children went to class. Miss Paramal didn't quite know what to do with Rainey either, but she was intelligent and kind, and in their time together, they had grown fond of sharing the morning newspaper over breakfast and tea. The newspaper that morning had been filled with the usual headlines, several of them devoted to what was commonly called the emergency. Things had gotten desperately out of control, the headlines reported. The school systems, the budget, the pollution, the crime, the weather, why, everything in fact, was a complete mess. And citizens everywhere were clamoring for a major, no, a dramatic improvement in government. Things must change now, was the slogan plastered on billboards all over the city. It was a very old slogan. And although Rainey rarely watched television, he knew the emergency was the main subject of the news programs every day, as it had been for years. Naturally, when Rainey and Miss Paramal first met, they had discussed the emergency at great length. Finding themselves quite in agreement in, about politics, however, they soon found such conversation boring and decided to drop the subject. In general, then, they talked about the other news stories, those that varied day to day, and afterward they amused themselves by reading the advertisements. Such was the case on that particular morning when Rainey's life had so suddenly taken a turn. Do you care for more honey with your tea? Miss Paramal had asked, speaking in Tamil, a language she was teaching him. But before Rainey could answer that of course he wanted more honey, the advertisement caught Miss Paramal's eye and she exclaimed, Rainey, look at this, would you be interested? Miss Paramal sat across the table from him, but Rainey, who had no trouble reading upside down, quickly scanned the advertisement's bold printed words. Are you a gifted child looking for special opportunities? How odd, he thought. The question was addressed directly to children, not to their parents. Rainey had never known his parents, who died when he was an infant, and it pleased him to read a notice that seemed to take this possibility into account. But still, how odd. How many children read the newspaper after all? Rainey did, but he had always been alone in this, had always been considered an oddball. If not for Miss Paramal, he might have given it up by now to avoid some of the teasing. I suppose I might be interested, he said to Miss Paramal, if you think I would qualify. Miss Paramal gave him a wry look. 
Don't you play games with me, Rainy Muldoon. If you aren't the most talented child I've ever known, then I've never known a child at all. There were to be several sessions of the test administered over the weekend. They made plans for Rainy to attend the very first session. Unfortunately, on Saturday, Miss Paramal's mother felt ill and Miss Paramal couldn't take him. This was a real disappointment to Rainy and not just because of the delay. He always looked forward to Miss Paramal's company. Her laughter, her wry expressions, the stories she told, often in Tamil, of her childhood in India, even the occasional sigh she made when she didn't think he was aware. They were gentle and lilting, these sighs, and despite their melancholy, Rainy loved to hear them. Miss Paramel sighed when she was feeling sad for him, he knew. Sad to see him teased by the other children. Sad the poor boy had lost his parents. And Rainy wished he hadn't worried her, but he did like knowing she cared. She was the only one who did, not counting Seymour, the orphanage cat, with whom Rainy spent the day in the reading room, and he only wanted to be petted. Quite apart from his eagerness to take the special test, Rainy simply missed Miss Paramal. He was hopeful then when Mr. Rutger, the orphanage director, informed him late that evening that Miss Paramal's mother was considerably improved. Rainy was in the reading room again, the only place in the orphanage where he could be assured of solitude no one else ever ventured into it, and freedom from prosecution. At dinner, an older boy named Vic Morgoroff had tormented Rainey for using the words enjoyable to describe the book he was reading. Vic thought it too fancy a word to be proper and soon had gotten the entire table laughing and saying enjoyable in mocking tones until Rainey had finally excused himself without dessert and retreated here. Yes, she's much better, much better, said Mr. Rutger through a mouthful of cheesecake. He was a thin man with a thin face, and his cheeks positively bulged as he chewed. Miss Paramal just telephoned with the news. She asked for you, but as you were not to be found in the dining hall and I was in the middle of dinner, I took the message for you. Thank you, said Rainy, with a mixture of relief and disappointment. Cheesecake was his favorite dessert. I'm glad to hear it. Oh, indeed, nothing like health. Absolutely nothing like it. Best thing for anyone, said Mr. Rutger. But here he paused in his chewing with an unpleasant worried expression upon his face, as if he thought perhaps there had been an insect in his food. Finally, he swallowed, brushed the crumbs from his waistcoat and said, but see here, Rainy, Miss Paramal mentioned a test of some sort. Special opportunity, she said. What is this all about? This isn't about attending another, attending an advanced school, is it? They had been through this before. Rainey had repeatedly asked permission to apply elsewhere, but Mr. Rutger had insisted Rainey would fare better here with a tutor than at an advanced school. Here you are comfortable, Mr. Rutger had told him more than once, and more than once Rainey had thought, here I'm alone. But in the end, Mr. Rutger had his way and Miss Paramal was hired. It had proved a blessing. Rainey would never complain about Miss Paramal. Still, he had often wondered what life might have been like at a school where the other students didn't find him so odd. I don't know, sir, Rainey said, his hopefulness slipping into dejection. He wished Miss Paramal hadn't mentioned the test, though of course she must have felt obliged to. We just wanted to see what it was about. Mr. Rutgerd considered this. Well, no harm in seeing what things are about, I suppose. I should like to know what it's about for myself. In fact, why don't you prepare a report for me when you return? Say 10 pages? No hurry, you can it, turn it in tomorrow evening. Tomorrow evening, said Rainey. Does that mean I'm taking the test? Oh, I thought I told you, said Mr. Rutger with a frown. Miss Paramal will come for you first thing in the morning. He took out an embroidered handkerchief and blew his nose with great ferocity. And now, Rainey, I believe I'll leave you to your reading. This dusty room is a hardship on my sinuses. Be a good man and run a feather duster over the shelves before you leave, will you? After hearing this news, Rainey could hardly return to his reading. He flailed, about a lot. he flailed about with the feather duster and went straight to bed, as if doing so would hasten the morning's arrival. Instead, it lengthened his night, for he was far too eager and anxious to sleep. Special opportunities, he kept thinking over and over again. He would have been thrilled to get a crack at plain old regular opportunities, much less special ones. Just before dawn, he rose quietly, got ready with the lights off so as not to disturb his roommates. They often snarled at him for reading in bed at night, even when he used a tiny pen light under the covers, and hurried down to the kitchen. 
Miss Paramal was already waiting for him. She had been too excited to sleep as well and had arrived early. The kettle was just beginning to whistle on the stove and Miss Paramal, with her back to him, was setting out cups and saucers. Good morning, Miss Paramal, he said froggily. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> I was glad to hear your mother's doing better. Thank you, Rainy. Would you? Miss Paramal turned then, took one look at him and said, you'll not make a good impression dress like that, I'm afraid. One mustn't wear striped pants with a checkered shirt, Rainy. In fact, I believe those must belong to a roommate. They're at least a size too big. Also, it appears that one of your socks is blue and the other purple. Rainy looked down at his outfit in surprise. Usually he was the least noticeable of boys. He was of average size, of an average pale complexion, his brown hair was of average length, and he wore average clothes. This morning, though, he would stand out in a crowd. He wouldn't he would stand out in a crowd, unless it happened to be a crowd of clowns. He grinned at Miss Paramal and said, I dress this way for luck. Luckily, you won't need luck, said Miss Paramal, taking the kettle from the stove. Now, please go change, and this time, turn on your light. Never mind how your roommates grumble, so that you may have better luck choosing your clothes. When Rainy returned, Miss Paramal told him that she had a long errand to run. Her mother had been prescribed new medicine and a special diet, and Miss Paramal must go shopping for her. So it was agreed that she would take him to the test and pick him up when it was over. After a light breakfast, neither of them wanted more than toast. Yet well before anyone else in the orphanage had risen, Miss Paramal drove him across the sleepy city to an office building near Stonetown Bay. A line of children already stood at the door, all of them accompanied by their parents, all fidgeting nervously. When Miss Paramal dropped, moved to get out of the car, Rainy said, I thought you were dropping me off. You don't think I would just leave you here without investigating first, do you? replied Miss Paramal. The notice didn't even list a telephone number for questions. It's a bit out of the ordinary, don't you think? So Rainy took his place at the end of the line while Miss Paramal went inside the building to speak with someone. It was a long line and Rainy wondered how many special opportunities were available. Perhaps only a very few. Perhaps they would all be given out before he even reached the door. He was growing anxious at this idea when a friendly man ahead of him turned and said, don't worry, son, you won't have long to wait. All the children are to go inside together in a few minutes. They made the announcement just before you arrived. Rainy thanked him gratefully, noticing as he did so that a number of parents were casting grumpy looks at the man, apparently disliking the notion of being friendly to competitors. The man, embarrassed, turned away from Rainy and said nothing else. Very well, said Miss Paramal when she returned. Everything is set. You may call me on their telephone when you finish the test. Here is the number. If I'm not back by then, simply call a taxi and Mr. Rutger will pay the fare. You can tell me all about it this afternoon. Thanks so much for everything, Miss Paramal, said Rainy, earnestly taking her hand. Oh, Rainy, you silly child. Don't look so grateful, said Miss Paramal. To Rainy's surprise, there were tears on her cheeks. It's nothing at all. Now give your poor tutor a hug. I imagine my services won't be needed after this. I haven't passed it yet, Miss Paramal. Oh, stop being silly, she said. And after squeezing him tightly, Miss Paramal dabbed her eyes with a handkerchief, walked determinedly to her car, and drove away just as the children were ushered into the building. It was a curious test. The first section was rather what Rainy would have expected. One or two questions regarding octagons and hexagons, another devoted to bushels of this and kilograms of that, and another that required calculating how much time must pass before two speeding trains collided. This last question Rainey answered with a thoughtful frown, noting in the margin that since the two trains were approaching each other on an empty stretch of track, it was likely the engineers would recognize the impending disaster and apply their brakes, thus avoiding the collision altogether. Rainey raced through these questions and many liked them, then came to the second section whose first question was, do you like to watch television? Well, this certainly was not the sort of question Rainey had expected. It was only a question of preference. Anyway, of course he liked to watch television. Everybody liked to watch television. As he started to mark down the answer, however, Rainey hesitated. Well, did he really? The more he thought about it, the more he realized that he didn't, in fact, like to watch television at all. I really am an oddball, he thought, with a feeling of disappointment. Nonetheless, he answered the question truthfully, no. 
The next question read, do you like to listen to the radio? And again, Rainey realized that he did not, although he was sure everyone else did. With a growing sense of isolation, he answered the question, no. The third question, thankfully, was less emotional. It read, what is wrong with this statement? How funny, Rainey thought, and marking down his answer, he felt somewhat cheered. It isn't a statement at all, he wrote, it's a question. The next page showed the picture, a picture of a chessboard upon which all the pieces and pawns rested in their starting positions, except for a black pawn which had advanced two spaces. The question read, according to the rules of chess, is this position possible? Rainey studied the board a moment, scratched his head, and wrote to Anna's answer, yes. After a few more pages of questions, all of which Rainey felt confident he had answered correctly, he arrived at the test's final question, are you brave? Just reading the words quickened Rainey's heart. Was he brave? Bravery had never been required of him, so how could he tell? Miss Paramal would say he was. She would point out how cheerful he tried to be, despite feeling lonely, how patiently he'd withstood the teasing of other children, and how he was always eager for a challenge. But these things only showed that he was good-natured, polite, and very often bored. Did they really show that he was brave? He didn't think so. Finally, he gave up trying to decide and simply wrote, I hope so. He laid down his pencil and looked around. Most of the other children were also finishing the test. At the front of the room, munching rather loudly on an apple, the test administrator was keeping a close eye on them to ensure they didn't cheat. She was a thin woman in a mustard yellow suit with a yellowish complexion, short cropped, rusty red hair, and a stiff posture. She reminded Rainey of a giant walking pencil. Pencils, the woman suddenly called out as if she'd read his thoughts. The children jumped in their seats. Please lay your pencils down now, the pencil woman said. The test is over. But I'm not finished, one child cried. That's not fair. I want more time, cried another. The woman's eyes narrowed. I'm sorry you haven't finished, children, but the test is over. Please pass your papers to the front of the room and remain seated while the tests are graded. Don't worry, it won't take long. As the papers were passed forward, Rainey heard the boy behind him snicker and say to his neighbor, if they couldn't finish that test, they shouldn't even have come. Like that chess question, who could have missed it? The neighbor, sounding every bit as smug, replied, they were, playing, they were trying to trick us. Pawns can only move one space at a time, so of course the position wasn't possible. I'll bet some stupid kids didn't know that. Ha, you're just lucky you didn't miss it yourself. Pawns can move two spaces. On their very first move, they can. But whether it moved one space or two is beside the point. Don't you know that white always moves first? The black pawn couldn't have moved yet at all. It's so simple. This test was for babies. Are you calling me a baby, growled the other. You boys there, snapped the pencil woman. Stop talking. Rainy was suddenly anxious. Could he possibly have answered that question wrong? And what about the other questions? Except for the odd ones about television and bravery, they had seemed easy. But perhaps he was such a strange bird that he had misunderstood everything. He shook his head and tried not to care. If he wanted to prove himself brave, after all, he had better just stop worrying. If he must return to his old routine at the orphanage, at least he had Miss Paramal. What did it matter if he was different from other children? Everyone got teased from time to time. He was no different in that respect. Rainey told himself this, but his anxious feeling didn't fade. After all the tests had been turned in, the pencil woman stepped out of the room, leaving the children to bite their nails and watch the clock. Only a few minutes passed, however, before she returned and announced, I shall now read the names of children admitted into the second phase of the test. The children began to murmur, a second phase? The advertisement hadn't mentioned a second phase. The woman continued, if your name is called, you are to report to the Monk Building on 3rd Street no later than 1 o'clock, where you will join children from other sessions who also pass the test. She went on to lay out the rules about pencils, erasers, and disqualification. Then she popped a handful of peanuts into her mouth and chewed ferociously as if she were starving. Rainey raised his hand. Mm, yes, said the woman swallowing. Excuse me, you say to bring only one pencil, but what if the pencil lead breaks? Will there be a pencil sharpener? Again, the boy behind Rainey snickered, this time muttering, what makes him so sure he'll be taking the test? She hasn't even called the names yet. 
It was true. He should have waited until she called the names. He must have seemed very arrogant. Cheeks burning, Rainy ducked his head. The pencil woman answered, Yes, if a sharpener should become necessary, one will be provided. Children are not to bring their own, understood? There was a general nodding of heads, after which the woman clapped the peanut grit from her hands, took out a sheet of paper, and continued. Very well, if there are no other questions, I shall read the list. The room became very quiet. Reynard Muldoon, the woman called. Rainy's heart leaped. There was a grumble of discontent from the seat behind him, but as soon as it passed, the room again grew quiet and the children waited with bated breath for the other names to be called. The woman glanced up from the sheet. That is all, she said matter-of-factly, folding the paper and tucking it away. The rest of you are dismissed. The room erupted in outcries of anger and dismay. Dismissed, said the boy behind Rainy. Dismissed? As the children filed out the door, some weeping bitterly, some stunned, some whining in complaint, Rainy approached the woman. For some reason, she was hurrying around the room, checking the window locks. Excuse me, miss, may I use your telephone? My tutor said, I'm sorry, Raynard, the woman interrupted, tugging unsuccessfully on a closed window. I'm afraid there isn't a telephone. But Miss Paramal, Raynard, the woman said with a smile. I'm sure you can make do without one, can't you? Now, if you'll excuse me, I must sneak out the back door. These windows appear to have been painted shut. Sneak out, but why? Oh, I've learned from experience. Any moment now, some of these children's parents will come storming in to demand explanations. Unfortunately, I have none to give them. Therefore, off I go. I'll see you this afternoon. Don't be late. And with that, away she went. And that was a portion of chapter one of the Mysterious Benedict Society. Thank you for listening. I'll see you next time.